Hi there, we are pleased to be joined by Rajesh Jain, founder of Netcore Cloud, once founder of India World, and that's where our story today is going to begin. Thank you so much for joining me, Rajesh, in our studio here in Mumbai, as it were. Pleasure, Govind. Rajesh, let's take a walk back. Uh, let me take you back to November uh, 1999, and you had a check, or I'm assuming it was a check, of 499 crores in your pocket and, uh, and in your hand. That's when you sold your company. Uh, many at that time, including me as a repo, younger reporter, called you the most successful dot-com entrepreneur of the time. And perhaps you were because you actually exited a company at a valuation which was stratospheric, to say the least. Uh, and yet, at that time, when many people would have gone into doing two or three things, one is become uh, angel investors, uh, second, give gyan to others, uh, and third, of course, keep investing in uh, series A, series B, and so on. So you did none of that, pretty much, and started a fresh journey. But before we come to the fresh journey, tell me a little bit about the first company, just to refresh everyone's mind, which started in 95. In some ways, uh, also uh, maybe foresaw the architecture of the internet itself, uh, which was India World. So yes, India World started early 95, and it came out of multiple years of failures after I'd returned from the US. I keep thinking that if any of those previous ideas would have worked, there would have been no India World. That's the life of an entrepreneur. And it came about because uh, I was looking for a success in my life. I'd come back from the US uh, and failure after failure and I'm wondering what to do next. And it emerged out of a two things. One was the internet had just started rising at that time. And second one was that my own experiences in the US, where I realized the internet could be a great bridge of distance. So it could essentially serve information, other kinds of content to Indians globally. And I think it was the right idea, right time. and. Uh, we were the first Indian portal to launch in March 95. We launched very close to the time Yahoo and eBay did. And someone was telling me that if you had focused exclusively on the US market, you probably would have ended up with one more zero in the money that you got after you sold. But I think I understood the Indians' mentality. I had lived in the US. I knew what the gaps were. And that's how India World began. And the four sites that really worked incredibly well for us were Samachar, Coach, Khel, Bavarchi, the vertical so verticals for news, search, cricket, and food. And uh, we had the website business, which got the cash flows in, so I didn't need to raise capital, Proficon, therefore. Uh, and uh, the advertising then started taking off in 97, 98. And, and you seem to have, at an early stage, uh, quite, uh, I mean, almost, let's say, shamelessly, uh, you know, mixed B2B and B2C. Like, many people wouldn't allow you to do that today. They'll say you focus on B2C. I mean, what is this B2B thing doing in your portfolio? Absolutely right. I think we could do that because we had no investors. <laughs> yeah. And we had to make money. We had to be profitable because there was no other source of capital for us. Yeah. Let, let me take you back. Uh, you know, you were in 9X, which is a telecom company. Was that what, in a way, gave you the introduction to the internet? Or was it just by looking around in the US? And this is 90s. I mean, yeah. it's a very different time. So, actually, when I left for the US for my master's at Columbia, my father had told me, finish your master's, nine months, work two years and come back. So for me, the sort of decision that I had to come back to India was done. Once I finished two years at 9X, my father called me up, so time to pack your bags and be back here. And I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I'd worked two years at 9X. I was very clear that I'd seen my father do multiple things and in his life as an entrepreneur. I don't want to work for anyone else. That I was very clear about. So but then what to do? So when I came back, uh, I was with a co-founder at that time, Sanjay Jain. And we tried multiple things, image processing, multimedia databases. Unfortunately, none of those ideas worked. And then late 94, I was back in the US, spent two months at a friend's place trying to figure out what to do next in life. I had gotten married. Uh, I was barely talking to my wife because I could see my company collapsing uh, at that time. And it was that time that when I went to the US in September 94, I, my first experience of the internet was through a dial-up connection. And I said, this is incredible. You're sitting here and you can access pretty much anything anywhere in the world that people are creating every day. New sites, new pages were coming up. And I said, this could solve a problem which I faced when I wanted to come back. How do I get information about India? How do I get the cricket scores? How do I get news? How do I get what's happening in India? Well, the only option was newspapers, which used to come 10 days later, or India Today, which was again a couple of weeks delayed. And from there came the thought that the internet could really serve as the bridge. And I had an audience... Which, I had, uh, which was very similar to what I had lived through at that time. And that's how sort of India World originated. And you had a few other options to sell. And uh, 
you you waited for something obviously which was the big one but what made you not sell earlier and then sell finally yeah so i had this habit i would talk to lots of vcs and uh, investors and potential buyers i had this habit of telling them in the first meeting pretty much what my valuation expectation was most of the meetings ever would not go to the second round and every time i failed i would keep upping the expectation so there were multiple rounds which had not worked we had the last a uh, term sheet that i had got was from bank of america for 13 million 13 and on the day they were supposed to sign they said that look we'll put in 4 million which was like agreed on but you need another 4 million because everyone else was raising lots of money i said but where can i go and get 4 million more now i don't have anyone else i'm talking to and they said no then we'll have to wait and as it turns out in that two months as i was wondering what to do we got two incoming offers one was from mail.com which owned india.com a us company and they wanted to merge india world or some indian site and take it public on nasdaq 6 months later i mean that was the time <laughs> uh everyone wanted to go public uh and then sifi satyam info we had just done an ipo uh, in india merrill lynch had coordinated dsp merrill lynch had uh, managed the ipo for them so they had a lot of capital they were like uh, an isp in india with a very small content business and the story that investors and they were thinking about was an AOL of india so connectivity plus content so they were looking for potential acquisitions and dsp merrill lynch was my banker and i think in 3 weeks time the valuation went up from for a 40 million again on for higher than the 13 million i had from bank camp maybe a month ago to 115 million in basically a few weeks Uh, yeah. So, Merrill Lynch. But the dollar was at a different rate, though. Yeah, so I was getting forty-five or something at that time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I think it, it that was the time when basically the stock prices used to go up few percentage points every day. Yeah. Money was freely available. The internet was like the hottest thing out there, and uh, time was seen as the sort of constraint, constraining factor, not capital. And yeah, that that th- those were the times in late '99. Yes, and then you mentioned a conversation with him in the Kothari in your book, uh, where he says that you know basically th- think about when you want to exit as well as as you think about when to get into a new business. And was that the piece of advice that made you decide that you had to sell at that point? Because if it's four ninety nine, why couldn't it be let's say nine ninety nine? I'm just thinking. Yeah, so I think to put it in context, we were three crores in revenue. Yeah. So even at four ninety nine, one hundred and sixty six nines <laughs> revenue. Now in today's multiples, when people think about it. Yeah. So. uh my wife and i bhavna and i had really built the business up over 5 years and for us this was our passion i mean this was a life you know for us and i told emil bhai emil bhai what will i do after i sell this is for the last 5 years we couldn't think of anything else besides this business and he said varish you will never get this kind of money again what the money will get you is freedom in your life you are a person of ideas you can do lots of things so don't get so emotionally attached that you don't make the right decision at this point of time and that then he said this line which i still tell so many entrepreneurs more important than knowing when to enter a business is knowing when to exit and thankfully i took his advice and uh, we sold right and so let me come back to the now the point where you had that money in your hand how were you charting your life uh, at at that point of time so this was completely unexpected because for the last few years before that all i had known was sort of failure and disappointment and capital raising and if you think about it sort of at some point of time money is just a number and the next morning sort of bhavna my wife said that and uh, i think it was your story which was there on the front page of et <laughs> um banner headlines i remember banner headlines and uh, she said that look if you think about the money that you have you will never do anything again in life so what's done is over forget about the money you like to build new things and just go about doing that and i think she kept me completely grounded you know otherwise it's very easy and luckily at that time there was no social media nothing i i went to work next day with b- b- barely anyone knew <laughs> where i was in that small office at raja center at uh, nariman point yeah i i must confess at this point that i got a ba- uh, i got a call from a senior manager at a bank at a public sector bank in nariman point if asking if i could share your uh, contact details <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah So I think Bhavna's words sort of stayed with me, and then I said that okay, what do I like to do best? It is about coming up with new ideas. 
So I spent the next couple of years, of course, with SIFI and we had to do the uh, merging of the content businesses. And even after that, the thought that I should retire or should sort of investing, et cetera, wasn't that, I was not very keen on it because what I knew myself as is coming up with new ideas and building things out. And in fact, if I look back, as my 30 plus years as an entrepreneur, I've probably succeeded twice and failed 30 plus times. Yeah. But that's what I like. Even I tried investing for, um, briefly around 2005, eight in multiple companies and I, I said, I don't like it. I am the, I'm the builder. I love coming up with ideas, making them happen. Failure is part of this terrain because most of the ideas don't tend to work. But that's what gives me joy. So tell me about Netcore now. I mean, this is obviously a different path from uh, India world, which was clearly more consumer facing, uh, as you talked about uh, content and connectivity, but, and this is different. So how did you uh, choose this? And within that too, you seem to have constantly looked and found newer fits within that. So Netcore basically came again, it sort of came out of India world just before I sold because we were doing a Linux main server business. So what was happening was a lot of companies would come to us saying, okay, the website is there. We're getting all these emails. Now, how do we reply to them? So they didn't have an internal mail server. And we created a Linux-based mail server as an open source alternative to Microsoft Exchange, which used to be very expensive at that time. And that's how Netcore started, because I separated these two businesses, because it was very hard to explain to investors, I'm running a tech business and a content business uh, together. Um, and Netcore, first seven, eight years, we didn't grow much. We, uh, I was coming up with lots of ideas and failing. Uh, and then in 2007, I think I made the, uh, the smart decision of hiring a CEO in Netcore. And uh, uh, then sort of we got serious about how to create, creating business solutions to solve real problems that businesses have. And one of the key problems businesses had at that time was communications, communicating with their customers. So email, SMS were just rising at that time. And that's the path that Netcore sort of has been on over the last 15 odd years. The core focus has not changed much. It's about businesses, large B2C companies wanting to interact, engage, communicate with their brands, with their customers, sorry. Uh, and what has changed are the methods of those interactions, but the core problem solving that we do for brands has remained the same over the last 15 years for Netcore. Right. And now let me touch upon some of the themes that uh, seem to accompany you uh, and as you focus on them. So one is uh, not raising money or not taking money. So why are you so steadfast about that? I'm not steadfast. Actually, I have to thank all the investors who have not invested in me. <laughs> so I was just counting going recently and I said, there are 50 plus times I've been rejected um, by VCs and PEs. So uh, see, what happens is that my terms for getting in capital I put forth right up front. And I can do that because I'm profitable. So I'm not desperate for capital. And this drive for profitability has been there uh, since I began. Because those were, again, that was advice from my father, where he said that, and that time, 90, mid 90s, he said, Bhar ka paisa nahi den. I mean, the Marwadi instinct of not wanting to take external capital. In his mind, it was debt, because he knew that debt could destroy businesses because of whatever interest payments and all of those things put together. And if I'm not taking external capital, then the only option is I've got to be profitable. So even though I didn't plan it that way, it turned out a little bit like this. And then I realized that if I'm profitable, and especially if I could get a flywheel going in the business where I could combine growth with profitability, I didn't really have to worry about being desperate for external capital. Now, because of that, and then the profitability sort of instinct has become part of our DNA. That if we can keep being profitable, we have freedom, you know, we can decide uh, what bets to make, what not to make, think about the long term. And especially when, you know, troublesome troubles come, you know, crises come, like the pandemic period, you know, when revenues sort of collapsed for lots of companies. We didn't fire anyone. And I, I had this line where I said, unicorns uh, fire, proficons hire. <laughs> um, and that, I think, helps build a better business long term, because employees now know that you know, you're not just, you're not fair weather partners in their lives. Uh, brands know that because you don't have investors breathing down your neck, you're not going to just randomly make pivots or just lay off 10, 20% of the workforce. So you become a stable partner for both customers and for employees, um, which I think helps us also take a, what I call the infinite mindset, like in a Simon Sinek's phrase, 
that you can think much longer term beyond the immediate quarter. Uh, for a business, you can make longer term bets. And it's, I think, a happier life for everyone. But it comes from the fact that, A, you have to be profitable and you have to have growth. Just one or the other doesn't work. Hey, but I think, uh, are you trading off on two things? One is, let's say, okay, so maybe what you're arguing against is institutional capital yeah. and everything that comes with it. The other is just going public, uh, which gives exit maybe to you to some extent if you were yeah. if you wanted to. And, of course, uh, employees who in your company have ESOPs, which I know you're buying back, but could that have been a, a bigger option? So how do you see, uh, I mean, how do you play off against that? No, very good question, because last year, in fact, we were looking to go uh, do, do, do an IPO, and Netcore is 25% owned by employees. So a very large uh, ESOP pool. And for me, the purpose of an IPO was twofold. One is, of course, liquidity for employees. Second is the currency for acquisitions. Mm. Because today, if I have to do acquisitions, I have to do it completely in cash. As you did one very recently. With Unboxed, as yeah. we did last year. And we've done a few others, but Unboxed was a large size acquisition. Uh, so, of course, our plan is to look at IPO. Then the market's changed. It was very hard for tech companies to actually uh, list. Um, so I said, let's leave that aside for some time till market conditions improve. Also for us, what's happening is now we are investing aggressively and expanding in US and Europe. So I think if we can do that, maybe wait for a little while, maybe wait a year till conditions improve, till we are able to show good traction on our international developed market expansion. I think that would be a very good story also to take to markets. Because there are very few global Indian product companies in SaaS and software, which have a very strong domestic base and an international presence. And that's the part that we want to combine for a very solid story to the markets on down the line. Right. And I'll come back to the capital point. And since you mentioned software as a service, uh, you've admitted in your book that you made a mistake there. Yeah. That you thought that uh, selling could, have be, could be direct face-to-face, -face, yeah. and in some ways you seem to have missed this whole SaaS revolution. Because we were, yeah, because we were selling in India and emerging markets like Southeast Asia, Middle East, uh, Africa, all of the selling is, was largely face-to-face. -face. So we knew a lot of connects because of our presence here for 20 plus years. So everyone wanted to be in person. Uh, you know, you meet them in person, that's how the sales would happen. But what we had missed was the fact that there was this, so even though the software was on the cloud, so we were a cloud company mm -hmm. in that sense. But the fact that sales and marketing could actually be done through the internet was a pivot that we missed. And what opened our eyes was when Kalpita, my CEO, uh, Netcore CEO, and I attended Saster. And we realized that, hey, you know, this can open up opportunities beyond what we are seeing. Because building a, a sales force in the U.S., sales team, would have been very, very expensive. And that's why we had never done that. Yeah, and I thought, I saw... The interesting contradiction there because the companies that you're selling your product to are doing exactly this, yeah. which is selling uh, directly, whereas you yourself uh, were not. Now, because B2B selling, yeah. my mind was always, I'd, we had to be in front of the person because the decisions are big decisions uh, and so on. But what we missed out was that even buyers were changing, you know, for maybe twenty to $50,000 spent per annum. Uh, they were willing to make decisions through the internet. And this was even before the pandemic. Yes. That was starting. Uh, so you don't need, really need a very large sales force. And companies like Freshworks and uh, others, Zoho, had done a very good job reaching out to global customers with their SDRs and uh, uh, selling teams, marketing teams, etc. in India with a very thin team. Almost replicating what the IT services team had done, but they had done on the delivery side. Now, it was the sales and marketing side for products. So that was the pivot, which I think we had missed out on. And luckily, we sort of Saster opened our eyes to that option. Yeah, yeah and, and I know you've talked about the importance of uh, meeting people, taking notes, uh, attending conferences, capturing them, so to speak, and therefore also saving money in getting those opinions. But let me come back to capital for a second. Uh, the third part of the other two uh, questions that I posed. Now, uh, people could argue that uh, if you want big growth, you need big capital. Or alternatively, and this is what I'm trying to get out of you, is it that the architecture of the internet is such that you have to fundamentally build and grow in that sort of bootstrapped way rather than go gangbusters? No. So both the options are possible. Now the question is, what do you use capital for? Now, I think in B2B SaaS companies, the primary purpose of capital is largely sales and marketing. Now, uh, so companies have done that well and they have succeeded with that kind of an approach. And uh, for us, really, what I, how I looked at it was that 
see once you get in capital capital also comes with its own you know constraints constraints as in you have investors and they have certain expectations etc and it forces you down to a sort of narrower mentality now not that we are averse to raising capital like i said i'll keep having conversations but having ended up without capital okay and but with profits which have been growing what it allowed us to do was to combine in a way the best of both worlds so we had we we knew we had to succeed in the us and europe but we also realized that just by spending on sales and marketing would not uh, make it happen you know would basically there's a it's a bottomless pit really in terms of what you can spend so our approach was look at acquisitions so that's where unboxed came in unboxed indian company but uh, all the customers in the us very good revenues very good marquee customers and exactly identical identical to the ones we would have wanted to sell to you know uh, e-commerce companies and so on so we said that that's another alternative where we could use our cash flows having said that of course if there was additional capital uh, available to me what i would love to do today is look at acquisitions because i think there are lots of struggling martech companies globally okay who are in the 20, 15 25 million range raised money at a high valuation and very difficult uh, for them to probably get the next round unless they're willing to accept very uh, much lower valuations but there's a good time for acquisitions that is what i would use capital for so if you think about it have a core business which is generating cash now the cash can help with incremental acquisitions it'll have help with good growth but this is a sort of breakthrough model of using external capital for doing m and a that's what i think we are missing today and that's what let's see how it goes right and it's a different proposition so which brings me to the point i mean your your book on is called profit cons uh, or about about startup to profit startup to profit cons which is obviously a dig at unicorns so tell me about how you see the unicorn model in and in the context of raising capital and so much of it so uh, of course there's the b2b type and the yeah. and the b2c side of it so let's talk about the b2c side yeah. because that's really where the big challenges have been saas companies tend to not require as much capital also if they do it right now on the b2c side i think where what has happened is that the single largest killer for uh, uh companies really has been the cost of customer acquisition so i think there have been a couple of mistakes which a lot of companies have made any any investors have the belief that uh india is a billion person market i think not for the first time and they have happening for 25 years effectively it's probably depending on the product it's probably anywhere from 20 to probably 100 million customers i mean we are eventually still at 2 and a half thousand dollar per capita uh country uh, income country now i think from that perspective uh the capital that has actually been used up for companies becomes is is sort of disproportionate to the market opportunity that's first second is what a lot of free capital you know from free as in just unlimited capital at an early stage does is i think it it puts the founders and entrepreneurs into bunch of bad habits indiscriminate hiring there's no controls on spending which happens and you can never build a business like that what is what uh, fred reichel in his book uh, winning on purpose said what's the best business you can build it's about bringing back uh, uh, how making sure your customers come back and bring their friends and family there is no reference to spending billions of dollars on what i call ad waste on the customer acquisition side so but that's what people ended up because that's what the investors wanted every monday you want to show growth in new customers but what's missing out and this is what i call sort of the falling of many entrepreneurs and marketers has been ignoring existing customers you do uh, you and that's how in a way when i was doing india world we spent almost no money on advertising both on the b2b side and on the b2c side i would build good websites i would get references hey my friend who's running this business would like another website why don't you go and talk to them and that's how we grew because we had no money it forced us to take care of our existing customers and in a way i think if unicorns actually thought about it that if i have to build a lasting business the only way i'm going to do it is by being sustainably profitable or how i like to put it is how do i think of exponential forever profitable growth and that requires a different mindset it requires a different model than having a constant inflow of investor capital which is basically then meant uh, to to show certain metrics on every monday morning meetings and but there seems to be like a fit of two kinds of thoughts right so one is that uh, 
many entrepreneurs are not thinking of businesses in that long term sense which yeah. which you are clearly describing and second if you are thinking short term then this is the way to do it acquire those 100 million customers or show 100 million downloads and then sell and then move on to the next thing whatever that is yeah but short term i don't think works i mean it may work for a few of few entrepreneurs i think as it has worked but it's never a sustaining business model i mean in my mind what entrepreneurs have to do is to run the business as if you're going to run the business for life of course you keep looking at opportunities which come so you're on a highway where there is no exit because that's how you bring in the passion that's how you make the right decisions on a daily basis otherwise your half your mind or 80% of your mind is just sitting on what metric do i grow to make it attractive for a buyer but what if this, what if those buyers don't show up which is what's happening right now or what if those investors don't show up then you are in trouble and that leads to the death of a business so the aberration was the easy availability of capital which many entrepreneurs took as the normal that was the aberration because businesses have to be built on fundamentals fundamentals are about taking good care of existing customers growing the business profitably and then reinvesting those profits for further growth some businesses do require initial startup capital but that cannot be the norm that after 10 years i'm being called a startup and i still need like another few hundred million dollars of raise that doesn't make sense to me right. let let's look within the company now and uh, and and the running of it uh, you know there's some interesting things you've talked about in terms of how you allocate your time i think the one important factor you, as you've said yourself is the transition to a more professionally run uh, setup and then taking a step back and not allowing multiple layers to build up and so on uh, the second is the way you manage costs and i think you've pointed out the dichotomy that you know too much of cost management can be also bad and uh, none of it of course can be uh, dangerous and i like two things you've pointed out there uh, one you talked about uh, i think an uncle of yours who said that you know don't look at the chori that happens yeah. in any company because it happens and ignore it and the second is i think you've talked about uh, your 100 dollar benchmark tell us about that yeah so my mama in pune uh, he runs a hospital and uh, but uh, is a doctor but uh, Uh, phenomenal insights in terms of business and uh, and just the world in general and he said in any place in any business that you run there will be some 3% 5% chori you have to assume it or 2% whatever is the small number if you try and optimize that you will basically be sitting and trying to clear every invoice every bill you will waste a lot of your time on that so it doesn't make sense accept it as cost of doing business and go on and go on with life and i think that makes a lot of sense because the only way you can delegate is if you trust otherwise every everything is going to just come back to me and i'm i'm going to be just caught up with all these monkey problems as i also mentioned in the book yeah now the yeah, second to come to you with monkeys and you want to ensure that they take it out with them yeah otherwise you're in a room full of monkeys <laughs> yeah. monkeys equal to problem yeah. um now on in the on so that's on the business level on the personal side also many times we basically make decisions trying to over optimize on uh, spending that we are doing and this idea came but this realization came to me when i was trying to optimize on a hotel in new york yeah. and i spent probably a couple of hours trying to find a 50 dollar 100 dollar cheaper hotel and i said you know this is like 2 hours 3 hours i've spent to save a few what, what, what am i going to save at the end so i call it the 100 dollar delta decision rule because what happens is many times we look at the absolute value of the cost oh this hotel room is 350 dollars i can't pay for it now i was prepared to pay 250 350 i'm not and therefore i'm trying to optimize because the 350 number is a barrier but i'm not looking at the delta costs the delta is 100 dollars is it worth my time to spend 2 hours trying to optimize 100 dollars for me not so what i've come up with is any decision and everyone should self set a threshold in their lives any decision say less than 100 dollars the answer should be a yes so if you're buying a book no no point thinking or a subscription which you or a subscription of a magazine i mean as long as it's going to be of some value just say yes overall you know how many such decisions are you going to make in a year okay most of the time it's not large enough to make any material difference in your life right so let's talk about uh, you know as you look ahead and you know you've talked about how you brought in different kinds of businesses uh, into into the net core fold as it were what's your source of ideas and and how do you how uh, i mean do you feel that as you look back there's a frequency or what's triggered those ideas and where do you typically get them and maybe what can others learn from them so there are ideas that are multiple sources and i think the first key thing for any entrepreneur if you want to get sort of new ideas is to have contiguous time which means not spending too much time on social media trying to respond to every incoming 
LinkedIn message or tweet that is there. Now, once there's contiguous time, you can meet with customers because they are the best source of ideas. They will not talk to you in their language. I'm very attentive to the words that they use to describe the problems that they have. They don't know the solution, but that's what the entrepreneur to do. Give me an example. Out. So when I was there in the US recently, uh, uh, a few months ago at uh, trade shows, and conferences at the trade shows are standing at the booth is the best time to learn because people are coming by from all over. The number one problem everyone started, uh, was talking about was rising cost of customer acquisition. So my CAC is rising. I'm trying to sell them the thought about, you know, do more with your existing customers. They're saying, look, 80 to 90% of my budgets are spent on new acquisition. How can I optimize that? Now, that is when it, it occurred to me that I have to change the way I talk to make it not about trying to optimize that because there's very limited room for optimizing, but to focus it around profits so they can get more from their existing customer. So that narrative changed Otherwise, I was trying to sell products which are probably in the 10% of their budget. But by saying that I can help cut your acquisition costs, your wasted costs by half, I can now expand the pool that's available. So this is a good way of listening to customers and them telling you what they want. As someone at the show put it when I was trying to tell him about Netcore and what we do, he said, there are 50 companies like Netcore out there who are doing the same thing. Show me what you have. And then I showed him our inbox commerce example of doing shopping inside the email. He said, you know, Mr. Jain, I would not even start by telling what you, what Netcode does. Show, don't talk, don't tell. You know, so these are great lines which basically come in and which I then repeat to people in my company. I think conferences, especially in the US, are phenomenal sources of learnings because for three or four days, you know, you are completely cut off from the world outside. And it's not about you watching YouTube videos or anything like that. It's about being present there, undistracted from all that's happening, being immersed, what people are saying, the conversations that you're happening, the words that you're, the, the, that you're listening to. I think all of this comes together. And for me now, all of this has sort of come together with the writing that I do. I used to do this a lot before my political work, and I've gotten back to it in 2020. I write every day. Um, on my blog, garagestain.com, which means that I have to have a source of new ideas. And I feel, I find that this uh, sort of flywheel of reading, writing, talking, uh, um, learning from conferences becomes a virtuous cycle of its own, uh, where the ideas tend to flow. And then I take these ideas back to customers and you get feedback. Right. So I think all entrepreneurs need to get into this cycle. So you you talked about uh, politics and let me now jump into that. So you worked on the India 272 uh, campaign. I mean, you built the whole 272, right? That was the so and and it was a very interesting digital intervention in uh, in uh, outreach to potential voters. And this was in 2013. I'm assuming just before the 14 elections, you were completely into it. You obviously were uh, aligned and part of the BJP in that sense, and you wanted the party to win. Uh, I mean, I, I know things have not gone very well after that, but tell me about that project itself for a little bit. And this is really one of my last questions. Yeah. So, as an entrepreneur, I like to look at big problems to solve. And in 2008-9, when I started thinking about a uh, big problem, one of them was that, what, why is India poor? It's a friend of mine who brought this question. And he said, you should think about it. And when I started thinking about it and reading and understanding, one of the things was that the political uh, scenario that we had in India was not very conducive for creating prosperity. I mean, we had limits on economic freedom, property rights, the things which has made the West, you know, US, etc., uh, rich. And Indians do very well there, but we don't do well sort of in our own country. So there are rules which hold us back. And at that time, my thinking was that the BJP with uh, Narendra Modi at the head was the best option for a pivotal shift in India. So I thought of myself as a political entrepreneur. Um, so I basically... Uh, that all politicians are entrepreneurs. <laughs> absolutely. I think there's a lot to learn, by the way, from, from politicians because see, in their case, it's a binary outcome. There are no prizes for getting 49.9% market share if someone else has got 50.1%. You know, you can spend the next five years thinking about it. So I decided that can I use my skills uh, from the outside? And I invested my own capital. I put a 100% team working on media, data, analytics, and volunteering to, uh, uh, to basically pivot the thinking 
from the BJP getting uh, uh, sort of the highest seats to getting a majority on its own. So that's what I call Project 275, which I wrote publicly about in 2011, saying that the strategy for 182 is very different from 282. And it's exactly how an entrepreneur would think, that if, I, if you are going to spend your time, why think in incrementally when you can be completely disruptive? It takes the same amount of time. The odds of failure are more or less identical. You might as well go with the big ideas. I think it was a great experience. And I always believe that you know, in our lives, we have to try out many different things. So for, for people who are working, try and become an entrepreneur. For people who are being an entrepreneur, try a completely different discipline. And there are good learnings which you take back, very happy memories of the time that I did there. But then I realized that my where I can be most effective is being a tech entrepreneur, not on the political side. Okay. Last question. Uh, you know, so uh, in November 99, uh, you had 499 crores and uh, you were obviously much younger. Uh, today, if you were to sell, whatever the price might be, obviously it's going to be a lot. Uh, you are looking at uh, IPO in any case, but obviously you would continue to run. Yeah. But assuming you were to do an outright or someone else would take over, would you start again? I would start again. Entrepreneurship is the only thing I know. This is what I've done for the last 30 plus years, but probably in a different domain. In today, being an entrepreneur uh, in the tech space, etc., is a five to 10 year commitment. Okay, so I'm not very sure I will probably have that same level of commitment uh, for the long term, but I think there are different areas. Like, one of the areas uh, which I'd love to spend time working on is that India needs great institutions for freedom and prosperity. You know, like the kinds which have been built in the US. A lot of institutions which are there, whether it's in the socio-political space, academic, educational space, or even the cultural space, they are all uh, with very small budgets you know, and which don't give them the scale. But what if we could think of whether it's think tanks, whether it's uh, departments at universities, with a hundred million dollar budget each. So my dream is that uh, maybe in, for the next 10 years, after some point of time, uh, uh, can, we, can I take one big idea a year with a hundred million dollar budget and build it out to may just make the next generation of Indians richer and more prosperous, which, is, which should be really, uh, yeah, they shouldn't have to leave the country to, to, become, uh, to become free and rich. Right, right. Arisha, that's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Kohund.